Hi, it's Lee from Colouring Queen, and today we're colouring the picture from Lady Spring Colouring Book. And I've already posted the first video for this, and I'll put a link to it up here on the right. And what I'm doing today is just colouring one or two elements with you that are the same, and then all the repeated elements, I'll just colour it offline so it won't be boring for you. And I'm continuing to use my 72 set of Colleen coloured pencils. Now, although I have got the 120 set of Colleen's, for some reason I can't bear to use them, possibly because I don't have any replacements and I have a number of the smaller 72 sets of Colleen's. So if you're following along with me, it's the Colleen 72 set that I'm using. And unfortunately, they don't have numbers or names. So I hope you're all doing well today and I thought I would tell you a story today inspired by this picture of the fairy. Now last week I told you about ladybugs inspired by this picture but this week it's fairies and we're going back in time for this one. So our story begins in the tranquil village of Cottingley in West Yorkshire, England. It's the summer of 1917. It's during World War I. Now, this small little village was about to become very famous. As well as becoming famous, it was also home to a nine-year-old girl called Frances Griffiths and her mother. Frances had actually spent most of her life living in South Africa, but now as her father was serving as a soldier in France, the mother and daughter decided to return to England and stay at the home of the Wright family who were relatives. The Wrights had a 16-year-old daughter, Elsie, and she was actually Frances's cousin. Now, during the war, it was quite common for families to come together and live like this in the UK. And the Wrights' home in Cottingley seemed idyllic with a wooded area and even a small stream. It's a type of place that children love to escape to and play games and explore. It's like something out of a colouring book, really. And even though there was quite the age difference between the two young cousins, they became pretty firm playmates and enjoyed actually spending time outside together, exploring the gardens and the world around them. One of the things the two girls loved doing was exploring the beck. Now, this is a name for a stream, and it ran at the rear of the property that they lived in. And often they would return home dishevelled and trailing wet feet through the house from their adventures playing at the beck. One day, after again getting in trouble for trailing wet feet in the house, the girls had a bit of a comeback for the adults. They had a valid excuse. They hadn't been mucking around playing. They had actually been off to see the fairies at the bottom of the garden. Now, adults being adults didn't buy that story. But Francis and Elsie doubled down on their story and they even offered to prove it. To do that, they proposed that they would obtain photographic evidence. Luckily, Elsie's father had a camera, a midge quarter plate, and after showing the girls how to use it, they quickly returned to the garden to visit the fairies. Armed with the camera, they spent less than an hour in the garden looking for the fairies and returned triumphant to the house. The fairies had been out, and they had managed to capture pictures of the winged pretties. Now, father and daughter both had a love of photography. Elsie had actually previously worked in a photographic studio, and Elsie's father, Arthur, was a keen amateur photographer. As well as the camera, he also had the equipment and the dark room, and so he developed the five photographs that the girls had just taken. He set to work in his dark room, the pictures were developed and the negative glass plates carefully stored away. Now the first picture shows Frances gazing slightly to the right, while in front of her there are not just one, but several fa fairies dancing. Now initially Arthur thought that these pictures were just cardboard cutouts, that his daughter Elsie, using her knowledge of photography, had skillfully arranged. But the girls denied this, they were adamant that they were real. Other pictures showed Elsie with the fairies, and each picture had one or more fairies in it. 
Now, a couple of months went past and the girls again borrowed the camera. By then, those pictures of the fairies were just put away in the drawer. Now, this time, the girls were unsuccessful at attracting the attention of the fairies, but they did manage to capture a gnome, some 30 centimetres high or a foot for my imperial friends. And Elsie seems to be beckoning in the picture to the gnome. Now, Arthur felt that the girls were either messing with the camera in some way or pranking them, and he decided that enough was enough and he would no longer lend the camera again to them. Now, Arthur's wife, Polly, she didn't really share her husband's point of view. And looking at the photographs, she believed the girls. She felt the photographs were genuine. And her daughter and her little cousin had managed to capture not only fairies in the garden, but also a gnome. She was impressed. Time went by and there was no more mention of fairies or gnomes in the garden, except the next year when Frances wrote to a friend in South Africa. It was a happy time for Frances then, as her father had finally returned from the war, and the family was really optimistic that the war was going to end in a matter of days. In her letter, she said, I'm sending two photos, both of me, one of me in a bathing costume in our backyard, while the other is me with some fairies. Elsie took that one. On the back she wrote, It's funny, I never used to see them in Africa. It must be too hot for them there. Now life went on, and it was probably an incredibly happy time with the family reunited, the end of World War I, but not everyone had forgotten about those fairies in the garden. The following year, Elsie's mother, Polly, attended a lecture on fairy life, and she brought the photos to a meeting of the Theosophical Society. Now, the Theosophical Society is a group that had already been going then for 50 years or so. Its aims were to promote universal brotherhood, study comparative religion, philosophy and science, and explore the mysteries of nature and human potential. It actually played a key role in the modern esoteric and spiritual movements, influencing areas like the New Age movement. Now, at the end of the lecture, Polly approached the speaker and showed them two of the photographs with the fairies that her daughter and niece had taken. And impressed with the pictures, they were then displayed at the annual conference a couple of months later. This is when they attracted attention outside of the local area. One of the higher-ups of the society, Edward Gardner, was so impressed that two young girls had not only been able to see fairies, but had actually been able to photograph them. Now, for him, that meant that there was movement in the evolution process where these things were becoming possible, more tangible. Things that were out of the ordinary could actually be captured on film. He had to know for sure, though, if they were genuine, as otherwise they would not be significant for for the society, for one thing. And it was time to get on board with the experts. So he sent prints of the photos and the original glass plate negatives to Harold Snelling, who was a photography expert. Now Snelling examined the negatives and concluded that they were genuine, unfaked photographs, with no evidence of studio work or paper models. Now the photographs were now becoming more and more well known, and it wasn't long before they reached the year of someone really famous. Really, really famous, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had one of the most amazing careers I've ever heard of. It seems that everything he turned his hand to, with the exception of a few things, like ophthalmology for one, was a sparkling success. By the mid 1880s, Doyle had become very interested in psychic and paranormal phenomena. He attended seances, experiments in telepathy, uh, sittings with mediums, and he became really convinced that psychic phenomena was genuine, not only from experiences of others, but also from what he had experienced firsthand. Now, he was well known and respected in spiritualist circles, and as he was a prolific writer, it's no surprise that he had actually been commissioned by the Strand magazine to write an article on, you guessed it, fairies for their Christmas issue. Now, it must have seemed like it was meant to be when news of the five photographs reached him. They were so appropriate for the article that he was writing. 
He had to ensure they were genuine, though. His reputation's on the line. So he contacted a gardener for the photos, and he even obtained permission to use the images in his article from Arthur Wright. Now, the Wrights were so impressed that someone of Doyle's celebrity wanted to use those photos, they actually refused payment. Pity. And pity that Polly had given those photos to the Theosophical Society. But anyway, he wanted another photographic opinion as well, so he went to the Masters of Film, Kodak. The pictures were enhanced and examined, and the text at Kodak also agreed with Snelling, the previous expert, that there was no evidence of the images being faked. But as the text believed that the existence of fairies was not true, they felt that the photos must be faked in some way, but they weren't able to say just how that was. And But it must be the case, because logic, there's no such thing as fairies. Another photographic company, Ilford, reported unequivocally that there was some evidence of faking. It's unclear from the material that I looked at if this conclusion was based on enhanced photos or not. But at the time, Doyle was busy planning a trip to Australia to give lectures, so Gardner acted as the liaison and Doyle didn't actually review the photos, only the experts' evaluations. At the end of the day, Gardner and Doyle reviewed the findings of the experts and they decided that the majority had said that they were not a fake, so they proceeded with that interpretation. Doyle asked the girls via Gardner again to take more photos. Elsie's father was cautious about this idea. At this stage, there'd only been five photos and some prints that the family had made. Gardner, though, he'd bought each girl a camera and he instructed them how to use it, assuring them it was all right if they didn't manage to capture more photos this time. For Francis and Elsie, they were insistent that the fairies would only appear for them. If adults were around, they would not show themselves. Elsie's mother was then sent to visit her sister for tea, which left the girls a window without adult supervision to coax the fairies for some photos. They took several photographs during that space of time, and two of them you can see the fairies in if you look them up online. The first one shows a side profile of young Frances with a tiny fairy near her nose, and it's been named Frances and the Leaping Fairy. The second picture features Elsie and shows the fairy with a flower in her hand, and she seems to be offering it up to Elsie, and it's called Fairy Offering Posy of Harebells to Elsie. A couple of days later, the girls would take the most controversial photo of what appears to be fairies in a bower. Now, this picture differs from the others, and the fairies are not distinct at all as they are in the previous images. And this photo is actually named Fairies and Their Sunbath. Now, Doyle used these photos in the Christmas issue for the Strand magazine, and the Wright family and the girls were given a pseudonym. In the article, these photographs, collectively known as the Cottingley Fairy Pictures, were evidence of the existence of fairies. Now, the magazine issue was a sellout, but not everyone was buying it. Some readers were very sceptical of this so-called evidence, but even the sceptics were unable to say how the photos were faked, and the power of the Doyle name led a lot of weight to the argument that the photos were indeed real, and it seemed that most people had an opinion either way. Doyle knew that there would be controversy, and it seems that he adopted the approach of any publicity is good publicity, particularly as it related to the topic of spiritualism, which he was heavily devoted to. Now, Doyle's article ended up being published in Australia and the US, and this gave it worldwide attention. It also gave the attention to the two girls as well, who'd been fortunate enough to photograph the fairies and the gnome. Frances would later tell her own daughter, Christine, that as a young girl in 1920, She was not used to this publicity and she really didn't like it at all. It haunted her. And it's hard to think what it would have been like nowadays with social media, what the publicity would have been like for these two young girls in the time of World War I and post-World War I, a time where there was such a great loss of life that it's only natural that people would gravitate 
to something magical and beautiful like fairies. Now, the first article did so well with the Strand that they actually commissioned another piece from Doyle, and the later photographs were used in that article in 1921, which was on the topic of fairy sightings. Later, that article would be used as the basis for his book, The Coming of the Fairies. And again, the reaction to the photos was mixed. There were some sceptics, others believing. Many readers had started to analyse the pictures and they were noting the very fashionable hairstyles of the fairies and their similarity to fairies found in children's books. Now, the fairies continued to attract interest and in August of 1921, Gardner again visited the girls in Cottingley, and this time he was accompanied by an occultist, Geoffrey Hodson. He was also a member of the Theosophical Society, who was a writer on all things spiritual, with an interest in clairvoyance and, of course, fairies. He'd even toured parts of England with his wife to stop and visit the fairies and take notes of their observations. The two men arrived in Cottingsley with their cameras ready to snap any fairies that they could see. Hodson would later document that he could see fairies everywhere. Unfortunately, the girls that day were not able to see any fairies at all. Maybe it was too hot. Eventually, the interest in the Cottingley fairies died off, and Elsie and Frances grew up and moved away from Cottingley and eventually married. It would be 40-odd years later that the fairies would again make the news. The controversy and debate over these pictures had never really ended. There was never any final conclusion to the question of, are they real or not? In 1966, the Daily Express newspaper tracked down Elsie and did an interview without, about the fairies. And in the interview, Elsie said, the fairies might have been figments of my imagination. It was implied that she'd managed to conjure up images of fairies in her imagination that were so strong they could be photographed. Now, that snippet of information might have satisfied the public for a while, but it wouldn't satisfy the media for too long. In 1971, the BBC had a nationwide program and they decided to investigate. Elsie again was contacted for comment, but she again repeated the same line. I've told you, they're figments of my imagination and that's what I'm sticking to. And it seems the fairy topic was reinvigorated, though, because the interviews continued. Five years later, Elsie and Francis were interviewed by journalist Austin Mitchell in September of 76 for a program broadcast on Yorkshire television. Now, I haven't seen the interview, but apparently both Elsie and Francis denied that the photographs were fake, but agreed that a rational person doesn't see fairies. Time went on, and the mystery seemed like it would never be solved as the answers that the girls gave were really not conclusive and they were somewhat ambiguous. It wasn't until 1978 that James Randi added his thoughts that things started to warm up. James Randi was a magician and a scientific sceptic. After analysing the pictures with a team from the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, what a mouthful that is, he noticed something. James claimed that the fairies in the picture were very similar to figures in a children's book called Mary, Princess Mary's Gift Book. Now, this book had actually been published in 1915, prior to the girls taking those photographs years later. Now, the team at the Committee for Scientific Investigation used a computer enhancement process to analyse the photographs, and they concluded that the photographs were fakes. They could even see strings, they claimed, supporting the fairies. Now, they weren't the only ones that believed that the pictures were fakes. Elsie's own father was sure the photographs were fakes and the girls were just pranking him, really. He was so convinced that while they were away one day, he actually searched the bedroom, looking for cutouts or pictures of the fairies or anything that would indicate that they were the fairies. He even took his search to the garden and the stream where the photographs were taken, but disappointingly, he couldn't find anything to prove his belief. A few years later, the same conclusion was reached by Geoffrey Crawley, who was the editor of the British Journal of Photography. 
Now, Crawley never believed for a minute that the images were genuine, but he wanted to establish it one way or another. He wanted to show how the images were created and prove that they were fake. So he investigated the images as well as the history behind them, and he did extensive research, even testing the original cameras to see if they could actually produce images that had the sharpness and quality, and he found that they couldn't. He also wrote a series of 10 articles showing that the photographs were faked and how it was done from a photographic point of view. Those articles were published in 1983. By now, the girls realised the jig was up. In 1983, Elsie was interviewed by the Unexplained magazine and she told Joe Cooper that while playing in the garden, her and Francis had seen fairies there. But the photographs of the fairies, they were pure fakes. Taking the copy of Princess Mary's gift book, they'd carefully sketched or traced the fairies in it, made paper cutouts of the fairies, and carefully placed it in position using hat pins to keep them stable. Doyle had even noticed one of the hat pins when viewing the fairies, but because it was in the middle of the fairy, he'd actually assumed it was the belly button, and he'd also assumed that because they had a belly button, the fairies were able to give birth just like humans. Now, once the photo shoot was over, what the girls would do was they would actually dispose of all the items, including the hat bins, in the back. And so it's no wonder that Elsie's father didn't find any clues when he searched their bedroom. At the time, it was just a prank to deceive their parents. But the prank snowballed into something so much bigger that than they could ever imagine. Once it gained local and worldwide attention, When Arthur Conan Doyle became part of the Believer section, it seemed impossible to back down. And in a later interview in 1985 on Yorkshire Television's Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers, Elsie said that she and Frances were just too embarrassed to admit the truth after fooling Doyle. Like two village kids and a brilliant man like Conan Doyle, well, we could only keep quiet. In the same interview, Francis said, I never even thought of it as being a fraud. It was just Elsie and I having a bit of fun. And I can't understand to this day why they were taken in. They wanted to be taken in. And the girls had sworn that they would never mention this again. That they would never talk about it. And that's why they kept silent for so long. Elsie also said that their little joke, the prank, it just fell flat on its face right away. And if it hadn't been for Conan Doyle throwing himself into the mix and excited about this discovery, those photos would have just been in a drawer where her father had thrown them. Like Frances, Elsie couldn't believe how willing people were to accept the fake photos. She wrote, surely you know that the cannot be more than one grown-up person in every five million who would take our fairies seriously. Elsie's dad, she wrote, was dismayed by it all. He asked his wife, how could a brilliant man like Conan Doyle believe such a thing? One of the big mysteries about the photographs is why on earth it took them so long to expose them as a fake. I guess it's easy in 2024 to look at the photos and say they are fake because it is incredibly obvious that they are. The fairies have a rigid quality to them that is quite sharp in contrast to the sepia of the remaining picture. There are other things as well that people have pointed out over the era. In one photo showing the fairies apparently flying, there's a small waterfall in the background And Brian Coe from the Kodak Museum in England states to show that that would require the camera to have a lengthy time exposure. But the fairy wings are sharp and clear, which would require a shutter speed beyond what the camera is actually capable of. Now, most professional photographers would know that catching a moving object like something in flight is difficult to detect without the shutter speed tech. So in other photos, the girl's don't appear to be even looking at the fairies. They appear to be looking to the side or away. 
And at the time, they commented that they were just bored, you know, with looking at fairies. They'd seen so many that day. But there was one thing that the girls didn't agree on. The fifth photo. The photo of the fairies in the fairy bower. Now, that fifth photo shows neither girl in it. It's the photo of the fairy bower. Now, Elsie believed that she took the photograph. Well, Frances believed that she took the photograph. Frances insists that the photo is genuine, recalling the details of the day. It was a wet Saturday afternoon, and we were just mooching about with our cameras, and Elsie had nothing prepared. I saw these fairies building up in the grasses, and I just aimed the camera and took a photograph. Elsie, though, she insists the photo is the same as the others. It's a fake. As to who took the photo, Geoffrey Crawley believes that they actually both could have, and it was an unintended double exposure. Frances's daughter, Christine, has said of that fifth photo, she never thought she could take photographs of the fairies, and she saw the grass had been shaped into a semicircle nest. Without thinking, she took out the camera, set the timer, distance and exposure, and it was only when it was developed she saw there was actual fairies on it. The Cottingley fairies, as well as being a 60-year-old long hoax, has so many layers of deceptions that make this story so fascinating. There's a real mystery on who knew what, and is the fifth photo genuine? The first deceivers were, of course, Elsie and Frances, deceiving their parents with fake fairy cutouts. Then we have Edward Gardner. Some sources claim that he asked photographic expert Snelling to improve the negatives, which gave credence to the fairies being genuine photographs, while other sources state that the improvements were made just for the purpose of reprints being done. Both things could be true, or neither, or one, or who knows. According to Dr. Braro, a professor of English and history at University of Huddersfield, who's deep-dived into the Cottingley fairies. The original negatives were actually underexposed, but Edward Gardner had them improved by Harold Snelling, a skilled photographic technician, and he'd asked him to evaluate whether they were faked. So Snelling was actually given two jobs, according to Professor Burrow, with contradictory aims. First, to determine if the photos were genuine, and second, to improve the images to make them more impressive. And he was incredibly skilled and he did an excellent job. Snelling made the fairies look amazing and he even airbrushed additional details onto the fairies' wings. In 2017, there are actually some allegations that were made that the parents of girls were also part of the deception. There were two photographs that were presented as originals which were said to be taken in 1917 and 1918 And one of these photographs was actually published in 1918 in the Spear newspaper, which was actually before those original fairy photos had been distributed and shown outside of the Wright household. Now, I haven't seen too much about these allegations, so I take it with a grain of fairy dust. But perhaps the biggest deception was Conan Doyle and his bevy of believers. Had the research been more thorough and hands-on or without bias, Perhaps he would never have written an article that deceived so many people, thousands, millions, maybe. Frances ended up passing away in 1986 and Elsie in 1988. But the story they created hasn't died with them. It's inspired numerous books, articles, TV shows, films like Photographing Fairies and Fairy Tale, A True Story, and many other look books like The Cottingley Cuckoo, and Frances's own memoirs called Reflections on the Cottingley Fairies. In the memoirs, Frances states, I hated those photographs from the age of 16. When Mr Gardner presented me with a bunch of flowers and wanted me to sit on the platform and had a Theosophical Society meeting with him, I realised what I was in for if I didn't keep myself hidden. Now, the photographs and reprints are found in museums, and they've made thousands and thousands of dollars. Prints of those photographs of the fairies, along with a few other items, including the first edition of Doyle's book, The Coming of the Fairies, 
were actually sold at auction in London in 1988 for over £20,000. And Geoffrey Crawley actually sold his Cottingley Ferry material to the National Museum in Bradford, where it's still on display. The collection included the prints and watercolours and even a nine-page letter from Elsie admitting the hoax. The glass photographic plates, they were actually bought in 2001 for £6,000 uh, at a London auction. And you may have also seen Francis's daughter, Christine, at the Antex Roadshow in Belfast, which was broadcast on BBC One in 2009. And she actually brought along one of the photographs and one of the cameras that was given to Francis by Doyle. And she confirmed, again, that her mother believed that fifth photograph was genuine all her life. Now, Christine ended up selling a bunch of photos at auction a few years ago, and it was good timing with the 100th anniversary of the Cottingley Fairies photos coming up. She's actually hoping that they will go to a museum so that people can enjoy them. She said that her mother told her that Elsie had the idea of faking the photos of the fairies and it was just meant to get them out of trouble. And it actually stressed her mother all her life, those fake photos, because it was just meant to be a family prank. Elsie swore her to secrecy and she said it ruined her life because she was looking over her shoulder the whole time and she didn't like that publicity, the dishonesty of it. She knew she'd seen fairies. She knew that she had seen them. She knew they were fakes, but she knew the last one was genuine and she didn't want to talk about it with her. The photos ended up selling for over £50,000, but one photo wasn't sold, so Christine will be popping that back in the safe for a while. Now, Elsie and Frances, though, they never made any money off the photos and nor did their parents. While those photos have been so widely used and distributed and talked about and who knows what else, unfortunately for the girls, the rights to the photos were given firstly by Elsie's mother to the Theosophical Movement. They weren't even sold, they were gifted. And years later, Elsie stated that when she saw a photograph of a huge church the Theosophists had built with the proceeds of sales of the photos, She grumbled that she and Francis hadn't seen a penny for their labours while millions of pounds had been raised from their work. So I'd love to know what you think. Were Elsie and Francis two mischievous girls with a clever trick? Or uh, is that fifth photo genuine? Is there a glimmer of truth in their tale? Could there be fairies dancing at the bottom of your garden? Let me know in the comments below. I know that there are some in my garden. And it's not too hot for them. They enjoy the tropics. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, keep believing in the magic around you and the fairies. That's it for me. Until next time, stay safe and happy colouring.